Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. As always, it's both an honor and pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He is an FBI forensic canine handler. He's a captain with the Kansas City Fire Department and has been on with them for 24 years. He's a human remains detection dog handler for arson cases and a host of other uh, applications. He's the owner of Storm Canine Solutions, and uh, it does not burn when he pees. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Darren Niemeyer. Thank you. Thanks for coming on, man. Uh, you know, we've known each other for a few years now. Um, kind of the, the backstory on how you and I met was, uh, was the dog in, in question that we're going to yeah. be spending a fair bit of time. Uh, it was from a breeding that I did years ago, and uh, you came down and, and picked her up and uh, have just been uh, kicking ass with her ever since. So it's uh, for me, it's it's really really cool and rewarding, um, you know, to to see a dog that came from a breeding that we made years ago. You know, here five six years later, um, just kicking ass and doing really well, and and you know the success that you've had with her and and all that you've been able to accomplish with her is is really really uh, just again rewarding and, and really cool. So I appreciate you coming down and, and being willing to share that. Oh, absolutely. It's uh. Yeah, that kind of kicked off a whole new direction in my life. You know, getting her and and uh, getting her going, and it's been it's been amazing. We've got to do a lot of really cool stuff together. Too. Yeah, well, like, yeah, I can't wait to get into it. So, um, what's the most grossed out you've ever been, uh, human remains wise? Mm. Probably, actually, probably wasn't. There's been a few. Well, one particular pops in my head. Uh, we were doing a search for a guy that had been missing for a while, you know, possibly attempt suicide. The area we were searching was uh, really thick, like bamboo type shit that was near a lake. It's thick enough the dogs were having trouble pushing through it. So we decided to turn and go back to where the vehicles were and regroup. And I was pushing through the bamboo shit, and I'm the one that stumbled across and the dogs were all behind me. And I'm like, no, oh, okay, well, here we go. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. So, um, but it was, I mean, it wasn't as far as, the picture of of him it wasn't gross it was just kind of a surprise like oh shit yeah that because usually the dog you know catches odor works the way in gives us an indication we know exactly what's going on but that one i just kind yeah. of yeah, stumbled across myself yeah <laughs> I didn't even need the dog in that yeah case. yeah uh what's your most embarrassing dog story um probably it's probably actually with storm at a certification um, I mean, she's so gets so amped and so driven that she sometimes will get mouthy with source. And we were at a, a certification test, and she grabbed the source and drug it out, and it was you know a large source, you know, shoulder down. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh god, really? Like <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what we're gonna do now? Yeah. Um, but I mean, since then I've you know worked through it, and got her to stop doing it, but it was kind of embarrassing for all of us. I'm like, well, she found it. Yeah. <laughs> she, she may bring it to us, but she found it. Like a fucking uh, retriever. Yeah. What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. Um, I, I mean, the, that's one thing that I think get not gets lost on a lot of people, but a lot of the little intricacies of training that way, I think are, um, are things that people don't think about unless you mm -hmm. do that, you know, whether yeah. it's grabbing odor or, um, you know, contaminating it or trying to mark it. I mean, there's a lot of little yeah. things like that, that, that you have to address that can be tricky and that, you know, if you want them to. Uh, from a exuberant standpoint and drive and motivation, go out and be excited to look for something. You've got to be real careful about how you correct or, or keep them from being too excited. And that's, right. a, you know, and, it's a really, she's a, she's a bark indication. So she's naturally amped and yeah. indicating even gets her more amped. And if I'm not close enough, then it just, you know, spirals into yeah. out of control. Yeah. But I mean, we've done tons of work on it and you know, to cap that where it needs to be and, and, uh, and does well, but yeah. 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 So it's kind of a 
kind of a fine line. Yeah, no, no <laughs> doubt. What uh, what is your morning routine? I guess uh, at the firehouse. Um, at the firehouse. So I usually get there. Our shift actually starts at seven. I've always always have from day one. The guys told me if if you're there at six thirty, you're late. So yeah. I'm there at six. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so I'm usually the first one there. Just kind of go in. Look at the lineup, see who I'm going to have on, on my truck with me for the day. Um, then it's kind of just sit around and visit with the guys going off shift. Is anything broke? Anything going on with the truck? Um, yeah. any- I guess, you know, from the time you wake up on the days that you go to the fire station, what, uh, like, what's a typical way to get ready to go do that? What's your, your routine prior to showing up? From the pretty, time? pretty simple, really. I, um, I'm usually up by five, let dogs out. And, you know, I've always, of course, got stormed several other dogs, let them all out, feed them, do whatever I need to do with them. Um, it kind of depends on where I'm at with, you know, working out and stuff. I'll grab a protein shake and, and head out the door. Yeah. I'm usually there by six. So it's pretty simple. I don't, you know, not, uh, I usually work out at the station. So I don't do that early in the morning that kind of stuff. But. Yeah. Yeah. Just keep it, uh, keep it clean and get, get yep. there. Yeah. Yep. Uh, where are you originally from? I'm originally born and raised in Kansas city. Oh, okay. Kansas city, Missouri. Yep. And, uh, in terms of your childhood was, um, was being in the fire department and, and specifically anything to do with dogs, was that part of, of growing up, you wanting to do that? I know you said you you started at 14 being around there, but what, what was kind of the initial push or drive uh, that, that made you want to do that? Well, I had a, uh, my cousin, I had a few family members that were firemen, um, one cousin in particular that kind of helped me get started. And I used to go to the station and he was there and I just really thought it was amazing what they were doing. And uh, just kind of got hooked on it, you know, just hearing the stories and them guys, you know, running out the door on calls and stuff. And and so I knew pretty early on that that's what I wanted to do. And that's where my focus was. Um, dog wise, I never I never really dreamed the dog stuff would integrate into it. I was always I love dogs. My dad had hunting dogs. Um, and actually, as a kid, I was allergic to dogs, Oh no shit. Uh, which I grew out of, thankfully. But, yeah, we couldn't even have a dog in the house when I was young because I was so allergic um but i always loved animals in general and uh then that kind of grew in the later years as far as getting able to integrate that with the fire department and doing something else yeah Uh, in terms of your your childhood siblings sports uh anything kind of out of the norm growing up that uh, that would surprise people or or is just kind of different not really pretty um pretty normal life um parents hard workers I, you know, I, I played sports some. I was never great at it. It didn't take me long to realize um, <laughs> <laughs> this isn't going to do anything for me. So yeah. I was more into, you know, fast cars and running around being a yeah. ding dong when I was in high school. My brother was the athlete. He played college baseball and stuff. So, oh, really? So a lot of our summers were focused around, you know, traveling, yeah. baseball stuff with him. Yeah. So Any animosity parents-wise of, of him being the favorite because he was the star athlete? A little bit, because because yeah. yeah, of course you know he was going places and doing things, and yeah. I was just the dummy yeah. hanging out in the basement <laughs> watching cartoons, you know. And was he your older brother? Yeah, yeah. older by two years. So now yeah. he's you know, he's been the police officer for 26, 27 years now. Oh wow! So it's quite the uh, quite the service family wise. Oh, we had we banner back and forth. Yeah, red team, blue team, yeah. stuff about all the time. <laughs> Do the uh, cop versus firefighter oh, boxing yeah. match? Oh yeah, yeah. Sweep the leg. That's yeah, that's all I'm right. Saying. That's right. Um, <clears throat> Uh, no, no sisters. Nope. Yeah. No, it's just me and him. For, oh, so from, from the time in high school, uh, when you decided, you know, this is not just what I want to do, but it's what I'm going to do. What does that process or what did that process look like for you? So for me, the, like I said, going to visit my cousin all the time, he worked at a fairly small department at the time. And I was trying to figure out I'm like, how do I get into this? What do I need to do? I want to do it now. You know, I was 14 years old and I know there's, you know, they like, well, you can't be, even be a volunteer until you're 17 at, at the time. And uh, so we started looking at other options and figured out there's Explorer program that we could set up, which is basically through the Boy Scouts, which I was a Boy Scout, Eagle Scout, all that stuff. So it was, I was somewhat familiar with it. So we started our own Explorer program at that department so I could start. And yeah. uh, that's kind of what how it took off. And we ended up with, I think we had five, or five six, seven people that, all joined my brother being one of them. I kind of talked him into join, joining the Explorer program because I couldn't drive and he could. So I'm like, well, if I get him involved, yeah. I got a ride to go. <laughs> I yeah. get a ride to go up there, and uh, so that's kind of how it started. And then you know, once I got old enough to start, you know, taking 
EMT courses and that kind of stuff. I took everything I could to yeah. be ready. Yeah. For, uh, from an academy standpoint, I'm curious. Uh, I'm sure a lot has changed since you went through just like the military, just like police, what have you. But can you talk a little bit about what uh, what the academy is like, generally speaking? Um, when I went through, it, I mean, I, definitely more strict than it is now. Yeah. Um, but it was uh, classroom, all, you know, in the morning. Um, we'd PT'd every afternoon, a lot of running, um, you know, getting used to running with, you know, carrying weight. Um, so we did PT every afternoon. Um, first part of the week we did EMS. Uh, second part of the week was fire stuff. So it was all, you know, learning the gear, how to put it on, putting it on fast, you know, learning how to throw ladders and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, it wasn't, I was expecting it to be more boot camp style. I mean, I've, I've never been in the military, but just that was my vision of it, but yeah. it, it wasn't, it was more technical as far as you got to learn these specific things. Yeah. Would you say that, uh, you know, from an academy standpoint, do you feel like it taught you what you needed to know uh, to, to be a, a basic firefighter that way? Or is it kind of one of those, like, it's a box that needs to be checked and opens your eyes, but, you know, where you really learn how to be a firefighter is on the job in the next six yeah. months or a year. Yeah, the, the, the academy just kind of gives you kind of a taste of it. Part of it's because they can't, they can't re, reenact an actual fire. They can't get the heat and the smoke safely um so it just kind of gives you the basics and then once you get out in the field um and they and even in the academy it's this is the book way this is what we've got to do to pass all the state tests to get all the certifications <clears throat> when you get in the field you'll learn the, the yeah. better way to yeah do it. i mean it seems like from a kind of fire science standpoint there's quite a bit to it that's pretty technical that um that I think a lot of people would, would maybe be surprised that it's mm -hmm. as science driven as it is. Yeah. I mean, cause yeah. a lot of how they burn and why and how to put yeah. them out, like there, there's a lot of science to that. Yeah. Is there not? Or yeah, there is. And it, you know, depends on the chemicals that are burning, you know, what, uh, and even, you know, older homes, I work in the, the older downtown part of Kansas city and those homes are built different than the ones, you know, on the edge of town, the newer construction and those buildings collapse faster and, and that kind of thing. So there's a lot that goes into, um, the building construction, what materials were used to build it, age of it, um, what's in it, yeah. if we know. Sometimes we have no idea. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot a lot of thought goes into, as we're going in, what, yeah. what could be here. Do they spend much time talking about, like, from a psychology standpoint, the how to deal with, with people that are freaking out and, and or that just lost a family member? Or like, is there much attention paid to that? No, not, not really. Not, not then. Um, now I'm not sure if there is. Um, you kind of just feel like at first you're just kind of winging it and, yeah. and leaning on the old guys to see how, you know, how you deal with that. Yeah. Um, it's getting a lot better as far as uh, the mental health of the first responders herself. Yeah. Cause that used to be, you know, you just don't talk about it. It's, that's what we do. You shove it down and go. Yeah. So now that that's changing a lot. Um, the, the mental health for, for us aspect. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, prep on this is how you deal with, yeah. you know, those things. But I mean, I guess it's as much of a question on my end as anything is, do you find or have you found that, that dealing with people in those emergency situations, that there is a lot of human psychology and in, in how you yeah. get them to do it, what you want and, yeah. and that kind of thing. And yeah. And, and, and for me, um, I've always been big on and never giving anybody any kind of false hope. Cause I don't know that it's going to be okay. Yeah. You know, for me, it's always, we're doing everything we can. We're going to do everything we can for you or your loved one or whoever it is. And just try to, to calm them that way. And not that it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. Cause to them, it's not going to be fine. Yeah. You know, this is their worst day. Yeah. And, uh, so I've had better luck going that route. Yeah. Um, stay positive, but don't give false hope. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, that yep. makes sense. Yep. Um, is there a, a top, uh, reason that houses burn down or maybe a top three of like the most common mistakes that people make that they end up burning their own fucking house down? Like what's the, what are the most things that you see as a cause? Usually electrical, either uh, space heaters obviously are always huge. Like even um, now with all the, they don't get nearly as hot and they've got the buttons on them on the bottom. And yeah. The, but cause a lot of people use old ones, lower income places. I've seen, I mean, they'll use, you know, if they don't have the money for a space heater, they'll start their, oven and open the door and leave it open to try to heat the house. So it's, it's usually things like that. 
more than um, just a malfunction of electricity. It's more yeah. misuse of. <clears throat> but would you say that's the, the, by far the biggest? Yeah. 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 So is it fair to say or to assume that there are a lot more house fires in the cold weather than there are in the... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah like way more? Yeah, and it's um, where I work in the downtown area, we have a lot of vacant buildings, so a lot of the homeless go in there and they, they heat however they can. Um, start a fucking fire in a house. Yeah. Yeah. yeah There'll be a vacant building, start a fire to keep warm and they may fall asleep and you know, it just yeah. grows out of control. Yeah. So, wow. uh, are things like cigarettes and candles and shit like that? Is that pretty rare or, or are those? No, it's still, it's, it doesn't happen as much as it used to. Cause just, yeah. cause you know, all the electric candles now and, and cigarettes aren't as popular as they used to be, but yeah. so that's not as much, but it definitely still, yeah, still happens. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, in terms of, of kind of the fires that you've been on, uh, I mean, having been with the department as long as you have and, and seeing the things that you've seen, I would love if you could share a, a couple of stories about kind of what uh, what fighting a, a massive, intense fire is, is like, you know, kind of from the, almost from like a, you know, a movie standpoint of like walking us through, you know, from the time you get the call to when you show up and, and what, what it all looks like. So usually... When the call comes in um, <clears throat> by the address, we usually kind of know what kind of building we're dealing with. If it's either commercial or residential or, or whatever. So for me as a captain, that usually starts my thought process of this. This is what kind of building we're dealing with. A lot of times we know the exact building because we've been out in the, in the neighborhood and the district enough that, okay, that's the, that's the furniture building. So we know there's a heavy fire load in there, kind of how the building's set up. Um, on the way, I'm usually looking at, you know, if I can see anything, thinking about the, the weather, temperatures, you know, as far as uh, for us standpoint, is it, you know, freezing cold out? Are we going to be dealing with ice? Are we going to be dealing with it's 100 degrees? Are guys going to be having heat stroke? Uh, so there's a lot of things like that go in, in route and uh, taking the information of the first companies that get there, what they say they're seeing, uh, if they have smoke showing or fire showing or, or what and where it's at in the structure tells us a lot. Um, so once we get there, it's by the time we get there, we're geared up, packed up and I'm on a ladder truck. So our job is to do, go in and do search and rescue and, uh, kind of open up the walls and stuff to help find any hidden fires, uh, that kind of stuff. Then the pumper guys have the, the hose lines and they go and actually put the water on it. So for me, it's a lot of sizing up the structure, forcing entry to the door if we have to, um, for a commercial, but well, Homes sometimes also, but usually the commercial doors are the ones we have to kind of size up to the door itself to force entry to get going. Uh, once you get inside, it, it just kind of depends on where the fire's at, how heavy a fire you have, uh, smoke conditions. Uh, I think that's one thing a lot of people don't realize they see in the movies. You know, in a fire in a movie, there's never any smoke because they can't film anything. So most of the time, once you get past the front door, it's pitch black. So you're going off of just feel and temperature uh, you can usually feel what direction the most heat's coming from and work your way through that way but um, unless it's burned through the roof then the smoke's going out but um, which is one of the reasons we put guys on there two of my guys always go to the roof to, to open it up to get that smoke and heat out of there it helps us find the fire it helps any victims that are possibly in there get the heat and smoke and everything off of them they have a better chance um, so then it's working our way into where the fire is at uh, Hose line guys are with us, knocking it down. So we're we going to overhaul mode after that, where we're pulling the ceilings down, open the walls up. You know, it's when the the truck company guys, it's fun for us when we're just just tearing shit up. <laughs> yeah. You know, just breaking know shit. And get, yeah. yeah, getting you know just um, you know taking windows out to get smoke and heat out, that kind of stuff. And then at the same time, other guys, if we're where the origin of the fire was, there's other guys searching the rest of the building to make sure there's no other victims and that kind of stuff. Yeah. I know, um, you know, firefighters are, are a group that we leaned on uh, or have historically leaned on from a mechanical breaching standpoint. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of the use a lot of the same tools yeah. and, uh, you know, I've done some cross training with uh, with some fire department guys uh, working the, the hooligan tools and yep. quickie saws and yep. uh, and shit like that. And it's pretty it's you know, it was it was eye opening for me as a young man to see how good firemen were at breaking into, into <laughs> shit. You know, I was like, yeah. Jesus Christ, it's that easy to, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, but it, it's, that's, that's one of the funnest things we do really, to me yeah. anyway, cause it's, it's 
a quick problem solving thing that yeah. you have to size up immediately and okay, yeah. what's the best way to do this? Yeah. It all, it, you know, to me, the biggest thing is it made me realize like the little button on the fucking doorknob that the door is locked now. It's like, yeah, it's not really doing anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, when you watch these guys that, you know, just kick a fucking door open or use a, a hooligan tool and, and pop it open in, in seconds, you're just yep. like, holy fuck. Um, the, is there a, a worst fire that you've ever fought that sticks out in your mind as, as being like, for whatever reason, whether it lasted the longest, you, you know, the most people died or, or it was the hardest to put out or, or a combination. Is, is there one that kind of stands out as, as there's, there's actually a couple, one, um, we lost a couple of firemen at that were good friends of mine. Um, that one was tough. It was a building collapse situation. Can you, uh, tell, tell us what happened? Yeah. Um, so typical night at the firehouse, it was early evening. I think it was eight or nine o'clock, something like that. Um, the fire comes in an adjoining district. And uh, so we usually always kind of perk up, listen to the radio, what they got going on over there. You know, those guys having fun and we're not, you know, we're watching TV or whatever. So when they get on scene, you could tell immediately it was escalating. You know, they had heavy smoke, heavy heat conditions. They were having trouble finding the fire. I'm like, man, that just doesn't sound like it's going well. The first floor of it facing the street was... Uh, storefronts there was three or four stores across there then there was um, apartments above it um so as it escalated they started calling more companies in so when we got there pulled up in front of the building they were still struggling to find the fire so we went through the, the alley to the back where they were taking hose lines in and the chief said all right take take your guys um go with pumper 25 which is one of the 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 pumper trucks that you know take them a hose line in Just go with them you're going down to the first floor where we can't find the fire. So they had, we had hose lines on the second floor. We were going down to the first floor and I just had this feeling. I'm like, this just is not, doesn't look good. So I told the firefighter with me, um, I said, this doesn't look good. Were you a captain at this point? Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. I said, this doesn't look good. Stay close to me. Listen to your radio. Cause we're probably not going to be in there long. And they're going to pull us out and go defensive. So we get down to the basement, we're working our way in there feeling heat we have a, a thermal imaging camera so we can see the heat's coming from the side of us like get a little hole open in the wall and i'm like okay we found it we found where the fire's at about th- that same time the command says all right everybody out we're, we're losing it everybody get out so we were quite a ways in there so i told him like we let's go we gotta go so we scrambled out i was on with the command knew knowing that at this point we're going defensive so we're putting the ladder trucks up, throwing big water on it, and basically the building's going to burn down. We're trying to save everything around it. So I asked him, I said, do you, he said, go get ready to fly pipe. I said, all right, do you want us around the back of the building? You want us to stay in the front? He said, if you can get around the back, come around the back. So at that point, I knew I couldn't get through the alley with our truck because there's another truck over there. So we walked around the other side, me and the firefighter with me. So we get around the other side, start getting our aerial set up, and we just were getting up in the air and we hear the bricks and a whoosh, just a rush. I'm like, it just kind of startled everybody for a second. We weren't expecting it that fast that the sidewall collapsed out. And uh, I seen it from the top, but I, I couldn't tell what all was going on in the alleyway. So I started hearing calling radio, mayday, mayday. You know, we have structure collapse on this side of the building. Um, then I hear him say we have firefighters trapped. It's still not quite registering with me exactly how bad things are. Then, you know, few minutes later we're we're staying on task getting doing what we're doing i'm like they got enough people there we got to keep doing what we're doing and uh a few minutes later i hear we're transporting two firefighters cpr in progress and that didn't register with me either because a lot of times we you know if we run a, a call where there's cpr being done they'll transport and they say we're you know we have firefighters going with us to the hospital to assist and in my mind that's what i'm thinking i'm like well it must be they're taking guys with them so it took a few minutes to register what was going on and uh so of course then we have you know half the city shows up you know guys everybody knows guys are there um who is it how bad are they that kind of stuff and and it took it was probably a good 45 minutes later before i even heard who it was and uh you know we were up still throwing water at that point and they said yeah it's it's john and larry and i'm like it can't be them you know larry uh, came on, we came on the academy together. John, um, he's a young guy. Um, 
worked with him several times, and it was just one of those things where you just don't think it's going to be your friends. Well, was it an issue of um, that's just part of the job, or was there, like, a, from an after-action standpoint, something that that a mistake was made, or, or is it just? Um, so the, the the big thing was it was an arson fire. Um, the fire was set in the back of one of the stores, and it went up into, like, a cockloft area that – we didn't know was there and couldn't get to either from top or bottom. So it was, it was burning all the, the structure out from underneath the first, between the first and second floor. And we didn't, couldn't tell that. And then once, you know, it got to the point where we can't find this thing. we got to get guys out. It's getting hot. You know, we've all, they'd got all the residents out by then. Um, but it had burnt enough that when the structure gave, uh, there were big wooden beams and they kind of, it gave on one end and then, the rest of the way of the structure pushed the sidewall out into the alley. Um, in in theory, the you know after action reports and stuff say we shouldn't have had anybody in the alley, but it was kind of the only good access. Yeah. And uh, so that it's kind of it was. You rarely see buildings collapse in that manner. Usually, it, I mean, everybody's seen a burnout structure. Usually, the inside of it's burnt out and everything kind of falls in. So for this one to go with the support beam pushing the bottom of it out is what, what got him. Yeah. I mean, going there, did you guys know that it was, that it was empty? Is it an assumption that you make? Is it? No, we knew, well, we knew that place was, uh, we knew those businesses were full. We knew the apartments, um, had people there. We didn't know, um, you know, in a, in a house that's easier and you show up, there's people out front. Yeah. Everybody's out. Um, we still search anyway, but like that with an apartment, we don't know who's where, so we have guys trying to get to the fire because, I mean, that's the, the best way to save people is get the fire put out. But we at the same time have people going hitting each apartment trying to make sure everybody's out. Yeah. Were there any people in the apartment that died? No, nobody died. Yeah, just the, your two guys? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, I, yeah. I mean, to me, that's, I, I, I guess I wonder, or it makes me wonder and thinking, you know, from a military standpoint, there are commanding officers or officers in charge or general, you know, whatever admirals, generals, people that are running the show that are super aggressive with certain things mm -hmm. and some that are not, I'm assuming it's kind of the same way, like yeah. mm -hmm. where, you know, captains or whoever's making that call to, to go in or not or whatever. There's some guys that really like to push the envelope yep. and some that are super fucking conservative. Yeah. 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 It's, it's the same way. Yeah. And, uh, um, and those, all, the initial responding companies to <clears> that were, were all from busy stations. Everybody's, our department's known for being pretty aggressive, um, but everybody's, they got a ton of experience. Everybody, you know, trust everybody kind of thing. So uh, it wasn't, as far as that goes, it wasn't out of the ordinary. Um, you know, it was, we knew that it was growing rapidly and we were probably <coughs> going to end up going defensive. The collapse was never, yeah. especially that early on, was never in the picture. You yeah. know, it was just something we weren't, didn't yeah. think was going to happen. Yeah. Uh, when when you guys do lose some of your guys that way, um, is it, and again, just th thinking about a lot of times or most of the time how it kind of pans out in the military, how, how do you guys typically handle that? Is it a, you know, hey, we still have a job to do and, and you know, we're trucking on, but we're going to memorialize them? Or like, yeah. how, how do you guys kind of? Yeah, so that night, of course, you know, that they transported those guys. One of them actually lived nearby. His wife was on the way home from work, seeing the fire. She's like, oh, there's a fire on the avenue. So she drives up. There. So she was there right as it happened. She didn't know it was him. Wow. So they, you know, they left with him. And somebody, one of their mutual friends, seen her. It's like, hey, we got to go through her in a, a, a chief's vehicle and, and drove. But uh, usually, which it doesn't happen, uh, luckily, for our department, we haven't had that a lot. But it's... Um, the guys that work closest to them, they get them out of the scene. Of course, they want to go help, see what's going on. Uh, the, then after that, in the days after, um, it's, you know, preps for funerals, taking care of families, um, that kind of stuff. When the funerals go on, all the surrounding departments, they all send guys in trucks to cover our station so we have guys that can go. Um, and it's, it's a pretty... Uh, I don't think cool is the right word, but it's a pretty impressive sure. showing of people. I mean, guys come from all over the country when it's yeah. a line of duty death like that. And uh, um, so it's, it's heavy, but it's also like, you know, powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Very powerful. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I actually didn't, well, they usually do 
kind of two funerals, the, the family one, and then they do a big one where, you know, the apartments from all the country come in. The, the smaller ones, um, I didn't get to go to. I actually, I was working the dog before storm and they thought maybe there were some homeless people in there. They weren't sure. So the next morning after the fire, we go home, everybody, you know, sees their family and stuff. Then they're like, we don't know there's people in here. So I went back down and I worked the scene for the next four days yeah. uh, with ATF guys, you know, searching the, the rubble to see if and there wasn't any homeless in there, but they yeah. weren't sure. Yeah. So I was down there when they did the, the family um, one. But to me, I felt like that's what I needed to be doing. Yeah. Well, in that example of that fire was the arsonist caught. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's got to be a tough thing to deal with. No different than like when a, uh, you know, an insurgent, you know, that you make the connection and you know, and, and you capture them maybe, yep. or, you know, like yeah. how, uh, how, how do you guys work with that? And so they, they actually put it together pretty quickly. The ATF, it was incredible to watch their, um, how they dealt with it, how they processed the entire scene, how they did everything. And they knew pretty quickly exactly what was going on. Of course, they had to put all the pieces together to have all the right evidence. Um, so of course, as a department, of course, you know, the guy's families were super upset, super angry. Um, and coming to find out this person had done it two or three other times, set their business on fire, trying to get insurance money. Oh, no shit. Yeah. So, Damn. you know, of course she got convicted. I, I think she got 78 years or something like that for it. Yeah. So yeah, it was in the, the other fires she'd done had been in other cities. So of course, when she opens a business in our city, they don't, you know, yeah, that none of that got put together. I tell you, man, that, that would be hard to to deal with that. Yeah, you know, somebody that was trying to scam insurance money and yeah. two of your guys lose their fucking yeah. lives over it. Yeah, man, that'd be that'd yeah, be really it, it was tough. It was uh, it was a big blow to our department yeah. and and just being in that situation, you know. Yeah. Is that something that as a department that you guys kind of talk about when something like that happens? Uh, I mean, other than remembering them, but in terms of like how to deal with it or, or anything like that, like do you guys spend? So th this, this, that incident in particular, um, they immediately had uh, resources coming in to talk to guys that were on the scene. Um, and after 9-11, New York put together kind of a peer support program and our uh, our union got a hold of them right away, and within a couple of days, the, some New York guys were here um, <clears throat> talking to us, and and you know hanging out at the station. They'd eat lunch with us and just kind of talk about their experiences and what to expect and, and that kind of stuff. So it was really cool. Yeah. That and and those guys are still talked about almost daily. I mean, yeah. almost that was probably six years ago. Yeah. And uh, we still talk about it every day. Yeah. You know, it's just. You know, John would have done that or Larry would have done that. And they, and those two guys were super different kind of characters, but they were your, your typical um, personalities that you get in the fire department. One, Larry was go hard, love to party, have a good time, just a <laughs> super fun guy to be around. And, and he, you know, loved his family. He didn't have any kids. Uh, so don't get me wrong that he, you know, wasn't a family man. He was, but he was just more of the, the party side. John had – um some young kids, family guy, loved to hunt and fish and that kind of stuff. So it was like the two. Yeah. That's usually the kind of the typical guys you get in the fire service. And, yeah. and one of the two of those. Yeah. 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 Um, doing that for a living, you know, going going on scenes and, you know, saving people and, and losing people and, and just kind of the, the dynamic nature with which that job uh, exists. I'm curious about, like, EMTs go through it, military folks go through it, where at first, like the first time that you see like a, a child that dies in a fire, you know, or even a person, pets, you know, things that you can tell, you know, like seeing people that, that are having the worst day of their, their entire life. Yep. Um, at first, I'm sure it's it's harder to deal with. You almost kind of become numb to it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, I am curious, though, you know, at least, you know, I can't speak to that having been in the military, there's a huge disconnect of, you know, people that like you're halfway across the planet. You know, it's not people that even speak mm -hmm. your language. They don't look like you, you know, not that you aren't empathetic to it, but I, I do think it's still different than, you know, the, the house down the street from, yeah. from where you live or, you know, type of thing. And so similarly, like, is there a, a method that, that fire departments use or a, um, kind of a, a, a training that, that's employed to, to help you, reconcile those types of things or is it just like that's part of the gig and you got to get fucking used to it 
um, when I first came on and for years up, up and probably till John and Larry died, it was the kind of the old school. That's part of what we do. You get used to it. You, you can either handle it or you don't. If you can't handle it, you, you shouldn't be here. Yeah. Um, which we know now is obviously the, the worst way to handle it. Um, but now we've got, you know, like the peer support pro- programs in place. Um, and it's just better. It's more talked about. It's more acceptable to be like, yeah, that kind of messed with me a little bit. And guys will sit around and talk about it. And for me, uh, going through, there was kind of a few different things for me when I, you know, I got that jaded kind of you would go run a fatality car wreck and you go back and you finish dinner, you watch TV and you, and you go on. Um, after my daughter passed away, it changed, that all changed for me. And it was, then I got in the mindset of, you know, we go back to the station, but I'm thinking, well, now the family's getting notified. Now they're thinking about planning funerals or thinking, you know, I, I went to that mindset for the longest time. Um, but for me, I always check on my, if we run something bad, um, I like to check on my guys, just, you guys good? Just yeah. even simple things like that, you know, yeah. and I, they've told me later on, it meant a lot, you know, and I'll yeah. call them the next day and whatever and just make sure everything's yeah. good. But yeah. Uh, you mentioned your daughter passing away. Um, can you share that story? Yeah. Or just um, kind of what, what all happened? Yeah. So uh, she was our only child. She was two and a half. Um, this was a previous marriage, right? Yeah. It's yeah. it was my only marriage. Um, and she she had a heart condition, but it wasn't anything. They just said she may not be able to play extreme sports, that kind of stuff. We'll watch it. She had a bicuspid aortic valve and couple of things like that, but a uh, pretty healthy child, super fun, great kid. I said, and it, me, before my wife at the time got pregnant, you know, when I was younger, I always wanted kids. I want a couple kids. That's the family. That's, that's the American dream. That's what we do. Then after I was in the fire service a little while, I was like, I don't know if I want to, I've seen too much bad shit happen. I don't want, I don't want to be a part. I don't, you know, I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to be that to be my life. And, um, then my wife got pregnant. She had a miscarriage, the first one. And I was actually, when she told me she had a miscarriage, I was almost relieved. Like, okay, you know, that's. Wasn't meant to be or something. Right. Yeah. It was just kind of like, well, then when she got pregnant with our daughter, and of course, when she was born, I mean, she had me, you know, you, you got daughters, you know yeah. how, they, how they do. Yeah. And uh, so me and her were super tight. Um, Great kid. I got to spend tons of time with her because of my schedule, you know, being work 24 hours off 48. So the 48 hours I was off, it was me and her and we were just doing everything. So when she got sick, it was, um, middle of winter. Um, the day before, uh, it was nasty, icy out. We didn't really do anything. I worked out at home. She loved to have a little home gym and she'd come stand in the door. I'd make her step out of the room when I was lifting. So she wouldn't get hurt or whatever. And then she'd come in and hang out between sets or whatever. And, we just had a fun, good day, played, um, put her to bed that night. The next morning I got up for work, uh, went in. She was, I could hear her snoring. She was two and a half. And I'm like, that's kind of weird. And went in and checked on her. She seemed fine. My my wife at the time, she was kind of getting around for work too. Everything seemed good. I headed into the station. Went there long and I heard a call come in um, for a, a, I forget how they, the call came. It was a non-breather or a cardiac arrest, I think. Didn't even pay attention to the address. Didn't even hear the address. And my thought was, man, that sucks. It's icy and shitty out. That's a shitty thing to deal with. And then within a minute later, I heard him send a battalion chief on it also because they said, you know, like a fire department member or a fire department family member or something like that. So I kind of perked up and then they repeated the address for him. And I was like, God, that's my house. Dude, that's crazy. And the only people there was my wife, my two and a half year old. And I know she wasn't, I know the two and a half year old wasn't on the phone. So I knew exactly, you know. And, uh, so I jump up and, and holler, I was a driver at the time and holler at my cats and my guys all, and we go out to, he's like, let's go. So and you went on the fucking call. Well, that I knew that I had to go, you know, it was the other side of town. I lived at the North end of town and I worked in Midtown, but we're like, okay, we're going to the hospital, wherever they're going. That's where we're going. So we pile on the truck. And of course my captain at the time, great dude, he was smart enough to be like, you're not driving. Yeah. So we jump in the back and had another guy drive and we headed up there. So I'm on the phone with with my wife at the time um on the radio with the guys on the scene they're kind of telling me what's going on so we ended up meeting him at the hospital and we spent 
like nine days. Well, they transferred it from there down to the children's hospital, spent like nine days there. Um, and they figured out, they think what happened that she had a blood clot that went to her brain. And, uh, so she had seizures for like 24 hours for the government to stop and that kind of stuff. And then we had to make the decision. I mean, there was, she had hardly any brain activity and they're like, well, we can keep her alive on a machine or we can, <clears throat> you know, stop all the treatment and she'll pass. And, and for me, there was no, it was, it was a simple decision. I'm like, that's not her. She, you know, that kid was so full of life. She, that's not how she went. Away. So it was really a pretty simple decision at the time for us. Um, so I, you know, they undid everything and I held her until, until the end. And, um, uh, how did your wife feel about it? Did she, about the decision? Yeah. To, she was the same way. Yeah. I mean, we were, we were pretty <clears throat> on the same page on a lot of things right then. And then even following how we grieved and stuff was, was really very similar. But, uh, even that, like, you know, like I said, I was at the station that day by the end of day one of that girl being in the hospital, they had my shifts covered guys calling, Hey, I'll work for him next shift. Um, they had three months worth of my shifts covered. Wow. Um, but that's kind of what we do as a, you know, in the fire service guys take care of each other. And they were like, don't worry about coming back to work. Don't worry about whatever. We'll take care of your house. We'll take care of your yard. We'll take it. You know, they just do whatever they um, some good fucking dudes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Some of the best. I mean, yeah. they, they were there hands down, yeah. you know, anything I needed at any moment, you know, the, that's awesome. When, when we learned we were going to have to disconnect from everything, <coughs> the, my battalion chief at the time was the first person I called. My family was all there, of course. Um, but he was the first guy I called and he's like, it was two o'clock in the morning, whatever he's like, I'm on the way. Yeah. Um, so, um, I, I feel like I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that doesn't uh, begin to you know, adequately convey uh, how shitty it, it feels to even hear you say that story, um, you know, but um, I, I don't know what else to say other than I'm really sorry to hear that. No, I, I appreciate it. Like and, it. That, and that's, you know, to me, that's, that's also what I need to say, you know, yeah. um, I've heard so many random things people say, trying to compare it to something or whatever. And it just, it just doesn't you yeah. know, nothing compares to it. Yeah. Um, and that was obviously a huge life altering Changed everything for me. Yeah. How, uh, and I don't mean to pry, but in no. true mic drop fashion, <laughs> uh, you know, what, uh, in terms of moving past that you know, from a relationship standpoint, um, what was that like? Um, and, and could you even? I mean, how, how do you do that? Well, we stayed together after that for a long time. And uh, I think we were fortunate that, like I said, we kind of, we grieved similar. If one of us was up, the other one may have been down, but we were very good about knowing where that other person was and working with it. And if you need space, you get space. If I need space, I got space. If we need to go do something together, we're going to do something together. Um, and we did really well for a long time. And we actually got involved in an organization that's for parents that have lost children. Ended up eventually you know, um, being the running a, a chapter of that organization to help other parents and stuff. But um, that was huge for us. You know, we, some of our good friends now were people that we met there yeah. that – were farther down the, the road than we were and kind of tell us what to expect sure. kind of stuff. But uh, it was definitely rough. I mean, it changed everything for us. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like uh, for the longest time, you just kind of close yourself in because you're like, I don't want to see, I don't want to see people laughing. I don't want to see people happy. How can anybody be happy right now? You know, now I know they don't know what I'm dealing with, but at the time it's just like, you don't yeah. want to see anything. Yeah. Um, and then eventually you kind of start getting those, getting back to it. The first, I remember the first time I was laughing about something after that. I'm like, how the fuck can I be laughing? My only daughter passed away. Yeah. And, uh, but eventually you kind of get to that point of, you know, I have to do something. Yeah. You can't just sit here forever. And, yeah. and you know, and yeah. So. Was, uh, was losing your daughter part of why you guys ended up getting divorced? Do you think, or was it, I, I think eventually, um, because we got to the point. So not long after that's when, the, when I got into the, doing the search and rescue, the dog side of things. I needed something not to replace my daughter, obviously, but some, I needed some kind of outlet, something to get me going again. Otherwise I was going to sit in the house forever. And, um, so I kind of got going down that road and it took off and it, it kept me busy and was doing something. And, and she just wasn't in that place. She was at a place where she was still in that, um, stuck in the house. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to deal with people. And it just, we just grew apart yeah. that way. Um, no, I have still have no hard feelings for her. And I don't know if she does for me. I don't think so. We randomly still talk, especially the you know, birthday anniversary of our daughter stuff. We'll text each other and, yeah. and, and stuff. <clears throat> but yeah, I think that, I think ultimately that's what it was, but it was, I mean, she'd been gone for 
14 years before we got divorced. Yeah. So. Wow. That's, that's a tough, tough story to, to try to even begin to project what, uh, you know, what that would have been like being, being a father of, of daughters. Uh, you know, it, I mean, not, not that sex matters at that point, you know, uh, man, uh, man yeah. And female, I, I think it's just a, uh, how that, that father daughter relationship yeah. is, is special yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, again, I, I, uh, I'm so sorry to hear that, that, uh, I can't even imagine, you know, but, um, so w- once you picked up the, um, interest and, and passion for the working canine side, um, can you walk us through kind of what, uh, how, how it started and how it's progressed into what it's become now? Yeah. So like I said, I, I was always a, a, a huge dog lover. Um, I wanted to do something with dogs. I didn't know what, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't military. I wasn't police. So, you know, I, I didn't know what to do. And, uh, my brother at the time he was in, in, a, a homicide investigator and I'd heard him talk about having cadaver dogs come in to help find, you know, weapons or, you know, knives or shell, you know, just different. I heard him using dogs to do that. So I finally was like, Hey, what's, what's the story on this? Put me in contact with these people. So he did and um, put me in contact with a, a couple of people that worked for the same police department that also had cadaver dogs. I met up with them a couple of times and, and that it kind of took off from there. They're like, okay, this is what we need to do. Um, they obviously knew my brother well and they're like, yeah, let's, let's, let's bring you on board and make it happen. And at the time, um, not knowing shit about working dogs, um, I was like, I was the typical I got a dog that likes to smell stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He'll be amazing at I it. I can teach him to find some shit. Yeah. yeah. And he was he was a Rottweiler lab mix yeah. of all things. But in, in looking back, it was a great way for me to start because he was really low drive. It was just kind of me learning what was happening. Um, so I started with him. And I wasn't a few months into working with him. I got diagnosed with, with cancer. And so that kind of threw everything off for a while. Um, then... Through that and trying to work with him, he blew a knee out. Well, that was kind of the end of his working career. Um, Then I got my next dog was a shepherd. Um, This big, goofy, lumber dumb, just a goofball of a shepherd. Uh, But I learned learned stuff from the first dog. I'm like, okay, I don't want this. I want him to do that. Even as far as indication, my first dog I started as a touch indication. I'm like, well, now I don't want my dog touching remains. Don't want him messing up evidence by Paul and Anna touching it. So I said, okay, this dog, I'm going to do a recall refined. I found out later that wasn't the best thing to do either. But at the time for him, it, it worked. He was doing great. Um, he got, um, he bloated and when he was four. Uh, so he passed and then I went for a, a few months without a dog. And then I'm like, okay, I got to, but I knew from him too, the things I wanted and didn't want. So then my next dog was a Mal mix, uh, who I still have. She's retired. And uh, she worked for, she had a pretty short career too, four four years ish. Made several recoveries. We got to do some really cool stuff. Repelled down into caves looking for stuff, and, and her uh, environmentals were like no dog I've ever worked with. I mean, just absolutely fearless. Yeah, that's the yeah, the pit bull part in her, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Too too dumb to be afraid of anything. Yeah, almost, I mean, and know? she was she well. It's people I worked dumb. with I called don't. her. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, people hear that like, oh, fucking dumb. Like it'll, it'll be in the comments. I'm sure I, you know, but uh, no, I, I mean the, the, the nerves are, uh, you know, one of the hardest things to um, get around or, or obtain or accommodate if, yeah. if they're not what they need to be, you know, yeah. cause you, you can't change them. You know, it's yeah. not like you can train shitty nerves out of a dog, you yeah. know, and that's, yeah, that's it, one it, of the biggest Achilles heels uh, that I've come across in working dogs, but. Yeah, and that and for me now, that's one of the biggest things for me. Doing yeah. what we do, it's always some kind of weird environment. Yeah. But yeah, she was amazing at that. She didn't have the drives that I wanted. Yeah. Um, no reward I could come up with what was better than her dinking around, smelling other shit. <clears throat> so that dog taught me a lot about how to read a dog because I could read her, catch odor, I could read her, work into it, all those things. Um, so I and she did well. She had the several recoveries. Um, and like I said, I still have her. Um, but I knew I'm like, this still isn't right. I need, I need a dog that's got more juice to it. And, uh, I'd read your books. Um, didn't really know much about you other than that. And, and followed your social media and, and you posted a thing about 
I have a single purpose, dual purpose dog that I want to donate and send me an email. I'm going to go through them. Well, you know what you put, but, um, so I was like, fuck it. I'm gonna try it. And I was, I remember sitting on the couch and my wife at the time was sitting there and she knew I, cause I'd, when, as I read your books, I'd tell her, Hey, let's listen to this. And I'm sure she was annoyed by it, but it was, you know, <laughs> and by then, you know, we'd had a couple of dogs already. And it's like, Hey, put this thing out. And I said, I'm going to send him an email. And she's like, he ain't going to pick you. It's like, well, I know he's not going to pick babe. me. Thanks, babe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks I for the support. support. But I was like, I know he's not going to pick me, but fuck it. I'm going to try yeah. it. You know? And in my mind, like I said, not knowing, I'm still way early on in the learning process of working dogs. Uh, I'm like, fuck it. I'm going to try it. So I think in my mind, I was like, well, he'll pick a police department somewhere that needs a single purpose drug dog. And that was kind of what my thought was. And then a couple weeks later, I get an email back. Hey, we picked you. And I was like, it's like, Hey, guess what? <laughs> he picked me. <laughs> We're getting another dog. That's fucking awesome. So that's kind of how that whole thing started. Yeah. And then, you know, of course we got come down and picked her up and then it was off to the races after that. And yeah. Just, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, to me, the, you know, I've, I've always, not always, I've, I've been in positions where dogs that I've had, it made sense you know, very specific, this dog is great for this purpose and, and I want to donate them, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, to me, it's, it's important to, to do that uh, when it makes sense. I mean, it, it doesn't always make sense. There's times where I've tried to donate to dog, donate dogs to departments and they actually said no in a very responsible way because they're like, Hey, we, we don't have the resources to, mm -hmm. to keep up the training. We don't have the, but you know, it's not even the dog. It's, it's, you know, we'd love to take it. It's just, we don't have a handler that we can dedicate right. to that we can't outfit the vehicle we can't you know do the the upkeep and training um you know there's a lot of elements that uh, unfortunately we just can't can't accommodate and so while i i appreciate that i you know i try to um you know give back you know when when i can and and it's to me it's important to do that you know to see dogs you know that that are a, a net positive and not just me being a consumer of them mm -hmm. is really important. You know, that's why I've, I've done the breeding that I've done. I haven't done much of it in the last few years because of, of how time consuming it is. But, uh, but I, even if it's a dog that I bring in and doesn't work out for its intended purpose, you know, if I can donate that to a department, I, I love to do it. But uh, for me, it's, it's just so much even more rewarding, not just that you're using her, but the things that you've been able to, to go do with her is, is really, really yeah, cool. Yeah, she's, she's done some amazing things. Yeah, I mean, just. yeah, it's awesome. Uh, before we get into some of those stories, one thing that you brushed over pretty casually is you had cancer. Can you uh, what? Can you t talk about that, what kind of cancer it was? And yeah, I had, uh, I had colon cancer. Um, it was about two years after my daughter passed and still, you know, dealing with that and grieving that and that kind of stuff. And, and uh, my wife at the time was a nurse and, I was like, man, my, my guts just aren't right. So we're kind of thinking, well, maybe it's kind of an ulcer thing or maybe it's just shitty fire station food I'm eating yeah. that, you know, that's just not right. So she finally, she was like, okay, you got to go get checked out. Okay. I mean, again, not the private being a, a guy in my forties, what, uh, like what were the symptoms of that made you feel like they weren't right? So it was just, my stomach <clears throat> was just rumbly all the time. It just never felt settled. Just kind of that feeling all the time. And I said, it was just kind of rumbly, like kind of bubble guts all the time. Um, I did start passing a little bit of blood, not a lot, not enough to be where I was like, oh shit, I'm going to bleed out or anything, yeah. but enough to make me think something right, yeah. you know, and that's what kind of, we thought, well, maybe it's like a bleeding ulcer type thing. Um, but that was really it. Other than that, I felt fine, but it was just a constant rumbly in my guts kind of feeling. Yeah. And, um, so I went, went to the doctor. Of course they sent me to get a colonoscopy. Um, I'm waking up in the in the recovery room kind of one-eyed like what the heck, you know, what's going on and uh the doctor knew right away he goes he goes well we got in there you have cancer before they even sent it off he goes, i've seen it enough i know that's what it is and i'm like what yeah i was, how, how I was th 35. 35 wow. yeah i was 35 and i'm like run that by me again yeah. <laughs> like, you sure you got the right fucking bed <laughs> yeah like, weed. What, yeah what'd you say and uh so i'm like okay well another shit show on my plate yeah. to deal with, but we'll figure it out. But, but actually, you know, after dealing with my daughter, I was like, it's another thing. We'll either deal with yeah. it. I'll either, it'll kill me or it won't. And we'll, we'll go on, you know? Yeah. Um, so after that, of course, then the doctor's appointment really started flooding in, figuring out how bad it was, what they needed to do. So I did surgery, colon resection. Uh, it took like 15 inches of my colon. 
Um, was the recovery on that really difficult or was it not bad? It wasn't too bad. So I've yeah. heard both. You know, yeah, heard mine that. wasn't bad. Um, you know, of course, they, they tell you from the beginning, well, if something happens, you could have a colostomy bag. I'm like, oh, fuck, I don't want to deal with that. You know? Did you have to have one for a period after? Nope. Oh, I was sure. lucky. Yeah, oh. I didn't have to. Yeah, that was the first thing I asked when I came to from that surgery. Yeah. I'm like, do I have a bag? Yeah. <laughs> and they were like, nope. I was like, okay, good night. Yeah. Wow. Um, but I had stage 3C colon cancer, which... Uh, stage three C, of course, one step before stage four. So I caught it just in time yeah. and uh, had surgery, six months of chemo. And uh, was that, you, you may not know, was there anything uh, in your blood work that would have reflected any elevated anything that would have tipped you off to that? I think there would have been. Um, I ended, but I didn't, you know, I didn't think about it. I, yeah. But I think if I was doing regular blood work type yeah. stuff, they would have caught it. Yeah. So that's one thing I do. I get blood drawn basically every quarter. Uh huh. You know, just to yeah. make sure that, that everything, that there isn't any, like, spikes in anything or huge. Yeah, I think there would have been, definitely would have been spikes yeah. in some levels yeah. and stuff. And they figured out mine that, you know, I assumed it was probably genetic. Um, so they did genetic testing and it wasn't. So they think maybe it was job-related, something I was yeah. exposed to sure. through the years. Yeah. I, you know, stress plays such a huge role in sickness, too. You oh, know, yeah. That, yeah. You know, just that's a stressful fucking job and then you lose your daughter. You know, I mean, to me, it... I, I can't imagine that those two things didn't have a huge impact yeah. on or contributing factor. Yeah, I think so. And, I, and I've met a lot of people over the years that have lost children that have really bad health yeah. because I think no, your I body just goes into this yeah. survival mode. Yeah. Well, and I, I'm assuming, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, that tip top health and nutrition probably isn't at the top of your list when something like that happens. Yeah. You're just like, I'll eat fucking whatever yeah. or not eat yeah. or you not know, eat or, yeah, or, or drink or drink. Or, drink yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, you know, I'm like, that didn't work. I tried that one night. It didn't work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was all still there when I woke up. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but it's, yeah, you, you just kind of go into, um, some people go into overeat because that's yeah. how they deal with it. Some people don't eat at all. Yeah. I, I didn't, I was never a, a big eater before before i mean i love food but it, yeah. i wasn't an overeater so i just kind of i'm, I'm the same way if, if shit's fucking squirrely i don't eat you know yeah. but um, that's uh that, that's a lot to deal with man that's crazy uh 15, 15 inches of your colon removed uh -huh. you said yep. i'm gonna ask it the first shit that you took after that was it painful yes yeah, yeah. like horribly painful or? yeah just because i think just because of all the more because of all the meds and stuff so yeah. you're just blocked up yeah yeah so, I mean, it wasn't like a, it hurts 10 inches up into my ass. No, it, no, no okay. it was just, just passing. Yeah, well, the, the, they said before I could leave the hospital, I had to pass gas before I could leave the hospital. Oh, okay. They're like, well, the more movement you do, the, and I was ready to get out of there. I was like. Yeah. I, Did it hurt the first time you farted? No. No, no but I, I remember, I, don't, I think it was my ex at the time. She wasn't, she happened to not be there at the hospital. I texted her. I'm like, I farted. <laughs> <laughs> Let's load the shit up. We're yeah, going home. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, so, I mean, I'm, I guess. I'm fascinated that, that that wouldn't hurt or that you could shit right after that happens. I mean, if they remove yeah, it was, that much of your colon, I mean, it, like they're just, I'm assuming, stapling, suturing, you know, whatever, one end to the other end, yeah. you know. Well, I, I think that's, uh, I mean, it took, well, I think it was four days that I was in the hospital and I didn't shit till after I left. I mean, yeah. it was oh, after four you. days. So it took, yeah. you know. So several days before, yeah, yeah I got yeah. you. Yeah, it's some fucking wild shit. And uh, after that, didn't need chemo or anything like that? Yeah, I had six months of chemo. Uh, after that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I had surgery. Um, then I had another surgery where they put a port in to do chemo in. Then I'd go in um, every other Wednesday, sit in there all day. Yeah. In the I, I've, I've never really talked to anybody that's been through chemo and, and asked them the things that I'm curious about. I am curious. You see how it's portrayed in commercials and movies and, and things like that. Uh, I mean, is it just god-awful miserable going through that or? I know there's so a lot for, of different kinds. But. Yeah, the, the kind I was on, so the first day I went, I had no idea what I was walking into, really. I mean, I knew, but I didn't know what to expect. Um, by the end of, by the time I left, I was there all day. Um, my fingers were freezing cold. <clears throat> I couldn't I couldn't drink anything cold. Just felt like swallowing razor blades. Really? Just, the cold sensitivity was insane. That night, um, I didn't feel that bad when I left. That night I got sick, throwing up, the whole thing, and I was like... Six months of this is going to be absolutely fucking miserable. Yeah. Um, Did it last though in between treatments, or was it just like the day you got it was? Bad? It would last for so I, I went every two weeks. Oh, so okay. usually by the time the two weeks hit, I was starting to feel pretty good. Then it they wouldn't go again. And you get kicked in the dick again. Yeah, but it, I, what I learned in that, I'd, I'd never been. I'd heard of acupuncture, didn't really know shit about it. Yeah. My chiropractor did it. She was like, "I can do acupuncture for nausea." 
I'm like, I'm willing to try anything at this point. Yeah. And she did. So I went every morning before I went to treatment, I'd go to acupuncture and I never got, you know, throwing up sick again. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's... I felt nauseous yeah. a lot, but never that. I mean, I, that yeah. made me, I don't know if it was just a mental thing or if it, uh, it made me either. a believer. Yeah. I mean, either way, that's a hell of a testament to, yeah. uh, to it in general. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. it's cool. I've, I've used it before. I, uh, tore my left groin on deployment, um, squatting on a ship, you know, underway where it's moving, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I tore my left groin and came back and was on the SISM team at the Navy pentathlon team and re-injured it and, and, uh, ended up, that was the only thing that fixed it was acupuncture and it was connected to E-STEM. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so it was kind of a neat mix of, you know, Western medicine and Eastern medicine yeah. kind of, kind of combined in it. And it was, I mean, it, plagued me for fucking i mean the better part of a year yeah. and it wasn't until i did that to where it was actually fixed so I'm, I'm definitely a believer of it also but uh wild shit man so uh, all right so getting into the kind of the human remains meat and potatoes um you know I've, I've obviously done a fair bit of detection work i know i know you have too i know a lot of people listening have but i also know a ton of people haven't so in the interest of not going so far in the weeds and over everybody's head, but also throwing some red meat to the, the folks that are, uh, you know, dog trainers and what have you that are listening. If you can kind of keep that in mind as we're mm -hmm. talking about things and describing a, a kind of happy medium, if you will, um, can you walk us through the, the process that you did to imprint and teach human remains and then uh, kind of get into some of the stuff that you've done in, in that realm? So the up to storm those first dogs it changed somewhat but with, with her what i did uh used an indication box strong odor in it i didn't want to get down into you know really small um, thresholds real strong odor in it and she obviously had all the drives in the world um naturally the crazy odor drew her in um i'll, I'll ask for the listeners i i understand it but just for for their benefit a lot of people would say where the fuck do you get dead people body parts and how does that whole thing work um Various places. I mean, we can use, I know a lot of people will draw their own blood and just use blood, um, medical examiner's offices, um, that kind of, you know, some hospitals will donate things, but there's a lot of legal goes with it, obviously, you know, uh, so we have all the legal paperwork written up. Um, families can donate. We've had, you know, families that had a family member die. We want to donate the feet to your organization. So everything has to be labeled, weighed, accounted for, labeled. Uh, we have to have all the paperwork when we transport it, that kind of stuff. From a storage standpoint, you know, it's one thing to store marijuana, heroin, cocaine. Mm -hmm. I mean, that has its own set of, you know, hurdles that you have to deal right. with in, in terms of storage explosives the same way. Um, having done a fair bit of that, human remains is even further tricky and different. Yeah. Uh, what is your method for, for storing them? So uh, the larger sources in a deep freeze, um, in a good heavy Ziploc type bag, um, to keep it separated from everything else. And but I have a freezer that's just for that stuff. Um, you don't want to be throwing brisket, pulling briskets right, out I of your have to uh, move foot freezer, the, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is that, is that what parts do you, uh, you have as feet or what? It, it varies. I mean, everything, you know, a lot of different stuff. It just kind of depends on where yeah. we, where we can get what, cause it is something that's hard to get. So yeah. we take what we can get. So the, the asshole in me can't, can't help but think like what better way to fuck with in-laws be like, Hey, can you run out into the, <laughs> into the garage and grab uh, some yeah. hamburger out of that freezer with the fucking red X on it? Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. Who the fuck? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway. So yeah, that, but that's how, that's how we store it. It's, yeah. it's basically just a common deep freeze. Yeah. Um, and then when, when you transport it, you know, you pull it out of the deep freeze how are you transporting it to training areas and, and handling it and things like that? Um, handling wise, you know, <clears throat> always using um, gloves, um, you know, like rubber glove, nitrile gloves. Do you keep them in something though, uh, or, or are they completely exposed when they're on target? No, we um, transporting wise, they're either in a cooler or you know, if it's smaller stuff in an ammo can type situation. When we put them out, it just depends on the scenario we're working in the level of the dog. Um, if it's a dog that we know is gonna get after to try to pick it up or whatever, then we, we, we you know, chicken wire or something to really protect <laughs> it. Um, other dogs in a, in a time, all dogs get exposed to just pure odor on the ground, yeah. um, on the ground, in a tree, in the water, wherever, you know, uh, whatever scenario working, but yeah. yeah. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just said, no, I, I, know, I know those, those types of details are, are helpful. Um, mm -hmm. all right. So 
if you can, if you could kind of continue through the, the imprinting training process and how you build from the initial exposure to proofing them off things and, and kind of getting them to where they're reliable and trustworthy. So like I said with her, it was, it, um, it was a uh, one indication box, strong odor in it. Um, she was in an outside kennel where she could see what I was doing. And, and at first she had no idea. It, it didn't take her long to figure out, Hey, the game's on. He's getting the boxes out. <clears throat> um, so I'd back tire to a tree, put the box out, get her close enough where I knew she was down when could smell it. She naturally would go check it out. As soon as she put her nose in the box, marked re- fired reward in, played tug, backed her up, back tied her again, restarted the process. And, and then after it was super automatic where, you know, I don't know how many reps I did, but for weeks, super automatic on one box and I added a second box. And of course that throws in the second box was empty. Um, so when she would go pick the right box and nose in mark reward, uh, big game of tug. And once, once two boxes were in the, in the picture, I'd take her back, back tire. Then I'd go move the boxes around, send her again. But each day I'd, I would do about three or four reps of that in the morning, three or four reps in the evening. That was it. Um, and then I would build up to four boxes and where it was just automatic, you know, that, and that they say, you know, 80% fluent, but I, I wanted closer to a hundred as I could get. So it took, I probably went overboard. It was probably, it was about two months before I even asked for an indication out of her. Um, but then it was, okay, we're going back to one box, put the box out. She goes out, puts her nose in. Where's my reward? Ask her to speak. Just so I'm clear at the risk of interrupting the, the four boxes all have target odors or they have blanks and distractors or, um, at first it was, the others were all blank. Okay. At one box of target odor, yeah. the other three are blank. Okay. Uh, and then I would just re I just kind of shuffle them around just do a shuffle game with them. But once she got where I got the indication on her on the single box, then we did the same thing, started adding other boxes. Yeah. Okay. So we were back to four boxes and then that's when the distractors start coming in. Then every box would have something in it. The, uh, on the distractor piece, um, are, are, I, I know like with explosives, there's certain chemical products, hand sanitizers and things like that, mm-hmm. that a lot of times can really throw a lot of wrench, wrenches in the gears of, of training. I can only assume having done, you know, very little human remain stuff, uh, but just in thinking through the same process, what are some of the biggest, hardest distractor uh, odors for human remains? I would stuff? say animal remains is the biggest. Yeah. Because um, there's so <clears throat> many, there's so many of the same chemicals. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know the exact numbers. I know the human body from the time that, that you die till you're decomposed as far as you're going to, your body puts off some like 870 some different chemicals. And there's a hundred, just under 200 of those last I knew yeah. that are human specific. So those are the odors we're trying to, yeah, you know. And I know that it's going to vary on, on conditions and clothing and humidity and all that kind of stuff. Is there kind of a, a range of time that you know a, a relatively exposed human body takes to to decompose as far as it's going to that you're aware of you know i i'm sure there is a solid number but it's so variable on the like I said weather conditions yeah. if they're in the shade or in the sun i mean i've seen um we've made recoveries where one person was in a shaded damp area they were out for i don't know two weeks and we were in another one well the one that i stumbled across he was out for like a month and a half but he was out in the sun and they actually looked very similar wow. from a month and a half to two weeks. Yeah. Um, very similar. Yeah. Um, so it's just, there's so much variable in it. Like yeah. I said, the clothing, um, that it's hard to say. Yeah. Um, usually if we get a call, persons are missing for two weeks or so. That's kind of the sweet spot. You could say where you're going to have a lot of odor. Um, you know, if you get into that, well, they've been missing for eight months, nine months, a year, two, five, ten years, whatever then you know it's going to be tough. Yeah. You know, it's just because then you're just dealing with super dry bones. But it just, like I said, it all, all varies on, yeah. on that. To me, one, one of the uh, – we're going to skip ahead a little bit, but just that made me think of some of the operations you've been on is, is cold case stuff that mm-hmm. it's been years that the dog has been successful in. Can you share one of those stories? Um, I'm trying to think of what maybe the oldest bone she has found. Um. Well, there, there's one, uh, we had two girls local that went missing at two different times, 10 years apart. Um, the same, they thought the same guy was involved. Uh, we did tons of searches for them. I think we did 18 or 20 searches looking for them. 
because they didn't know where they were at. So it was kind of covering areas where they thought this guy had access to. Um, and once we found it, it was actually another dog that made the initial um, find. And then all the dogs kind of converged in that area. So there was remains from 10 years ago. To, and then the newest was, I think she had been missing for three or four months. Yeah. And they were all kind of intermingled just because they were placed next to each other. Yeah. Um, but it was a, for our area, it was a super huge um, case that, that these two girls have been missing. Like I said, the one for 10 years, they didn't know what happened to her. Yeah. Um, but it was a very distinct difference in the dogs too. And you'd see them catch odor and work in and find a bone. Um, you know, they worked quicker, faster, of course, to the newer, newer ones, older ones, they would still find and indicate on, but it was a much slower, yeah. less odor process. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that body language read, uh, as anybody listening who's handled a dog, or even if you have a pet, I mean, you can, I mean, most people, even with your house pet, like, could say, oh, he's about to take a shit. Yep. You know, it's like, somebody else may look at that and be like, how do you know? It's like, well, I just know. I can yep. tell by the way he's walking, you know, whatever. Yep. And, and that that's 95% of being a dog handler is just Absolutely. being really fucking good at, at paying attention to your dog yep. and, and what they're communicating to you based on what their body does in relation to what they're smelling, you know, yeah. and, uh, yeah, and I, that's, to me, that's one of the most fascinating things about watching the dog work yeah. and body language and, and being able to tell, yeah, she's in odor or she's in odor, but it's not human odor. It's, yeah. you know, animal remains yeah. or whatever. You can just tell by, yep. you know, storm saying it's her tail. It's, it's, it's yeah. like a flag. It just tells yeah. me, I can tell exactly. I can see her butt only and tell you if she's on For human sure. remains or, yeah. you know, something. Yeah. Like I, that. I, yeah. I remember, uh, you know, when I was out on the West coast with the, MPC, the multi-purpose canine program, uh, you know, we would do some explosive detection, big loops where it was like a, you know, seven to 10 mile mm -hmm. hump in basically, you know, where, uh, the dog is, is going to be accompanying a, a platoon or a task element or whatever over a long insertion at, at elevation, whatever. And there'd be, you know, four or five explosive finds along this 10 mile track but we'd throw a bite work scenario in and, and naturally or inherently there would be wild game present too. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, to me, that was one of the neat things, uh, both in, in witnessing it as well as, you know, training handlers to identify it is, you know, okay, wh watch your dog. What's he doing? What do you think? You know? And, and mm -hmm. it's like, you, you can tell, you know, a f slight feather of the tail and, and intern in intensified sniffing and, and kind of doing snaking back and forth. Like, no, that, that's game. You know, or if it's a, a real heavy tail wag and, and a real hard head snap and, and really vacuuming the, the, the air air sent thing to ground or whatever to locate source, that's, you know, your target odor. On the transverse, you know, with these dual purpose dogs, then then the, the other side that you would see that was vastly different is when they come in human odor, oh. strange human odor, where it, it's like watching a 19-year-old marine at a bar about to get in a fight you know it's just it's a totally different you know they stiffen up and their ears come up and they they fucking bow their chest and you know it's it's just like it's a totally different thing that you see and it's like no there's a fucking human somewhere nearby and you know and, and it's so neat to watch the progression of, of handlers where they go through you know at first like well yeah i mean they smell something but they have yeah. no fucking idea to where yeah. it's like dude there's somebody getting ready to ambush us you know it's like that dog yeah. can can save your fucking life in so many ways and or in this application that they can just tell you so much yeah, yeah. by what they're doing if, if you're willing to pay attention. Yeah, and that's you know? one of it, anymore. Um, that's one of my favorite things is teaching handlers. And that's kind of why I started Storm Canine Solutions was teaching seminars. I want to, yeah. it's so fascinating to me to, to work with a new handler that has no idea and you can point those things out. This is what's happening and you see the light bulb go off and yeah. it's like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, to me, that's, almost as fun or more fun anymore than actually going on searches. Yeah. It's, you know, yeah. getting other people at that point, sure. you know, is absolutely it's fascinating to me. Yeah. Yeah. Amen on that. Um, all right. So you, you kind of get her to where, um, you know, you're, you're playing the shell game, you're yep. doing multiple boxes, getting her where she's pretty dialed in on odor. Uh, do you remember, I, I know you remember what, what was the first real world mission that she went on and, and had success that you were just like, Holy shit, we did it. So it was kind of an odd one, um, of course. Well, all of our searches are odd, otherwise they wouldn't need us. But So it was a uh, small town, homeless guy, lived down by the little, the little city park. Everybody knew him. He'd walk his bike. He um, had a, a bad leg, couldn't ride a bike, but he used it like a walker. They're like, and nobody had seen him for several days. 
uh, his stuff was all there at the park. They're like, he cannot leave this park without walking with that bike. He's got to be right here somewhere. So we had, I'm trying to think how many dogs we had there on our team. I think there's three or four at the time. Um, I said Storm was young. So we split up the park. You know, who's going to search where? Um, it was winter. It was extremely cold out. The Where the park was, there was a big creek ran through. It had like one of those low head dams that come over with the water just churning underneath of it. Well, eventually we searched and we got downstream from that. And Storm starts throwing the body behavior. Um, you know, throwing her head up and going out of the water. And she'd kind of go by the trees and back down. And it was just like... You could tell, I'm like, okay, we got something going on here. At the time, I was somewhat experienced handler, but not, you know, I knew something was going on. Let's kind of play this out. And she would get down by the water, put her head in, you know, dunk her face in the water, which she's not a huge lover of water. So I knew dunking her face in is telling me something. And she'd go up to this tree that was just up from it, was started throwing indications and just moving around. Well, obviously, we couldn't see in the water. So, um told the local authorities, you know, they were there with us. This is what's going on. They brought the, the fire department out, dive team, like, well, we can't dive right there right now with the way the water's churning and stuff and because it was starting to melt, so it was really active. Um, and then, so we didn't really get an answer right away. And I'm like, she was on something. I mean, it's, it's got to be there. And then we found out a few days later he he popped up in, in that area and uh, they recovered him. Yeah. And, did, uh, did you reward her when she showed that? I didn't. Um because I wasn't sure yeah. and um, kind of my philosophy and, and one of the guys that I've done a lot of work with um, his philosophy has always been, if you build enough positive rewards with, you know, you're correct. If you don't reward here or there, yeah. it's not going to deplete the, you know, yeah. it's kind of a, he always used the, you know, I like have a bank account. You got enough, put yeah. enough deposits in and don't, you know, yeah. withdraw enough times. You're still good. Yeah. So that's yeah. kind of my philosophy on it. Yeah, no, I, I tend to agree. I think, uh, you know, where the dog is at in their, in their progression plays probably the yeah. biggest, biggest role yeah. in that. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm always curious. I've seen guys do it both way. And, and to me, it kind of depends on the dog and how far, far along they are. But I was just curious, um, at, at what point, so that was, uh, kind of the first, uh, success, mm-hmm. um, moving on. Are, are there any other searches that you can share, between then and when you kind of got involved uh, from an FBI standpoint, and I, I do want to clarify or, or throw a caveat to the listener slash viewers that uh, there are certain things that because of his work with the FBI that he that he can't get into, but he will he will share to the best of his ability. So keep that in mind if he's vague, it's uh, it's on purpose. But uh, between that first success and and getting involved FBI wise, what are some other searches that uh, that you were successful on that you can share? Um, between then, it'd be hard for me to even remember. We, we did at that time, we were going on a lot of searches. Um, and they, they kind of come in waves. And just as a, as a query that way, uh, how, how do those come to fruition? You know, like, so we have a, uh, it, it kind of varies depending on who I'm going out for the, our local search team. Um, they, we have like a, a dispatcher, um, all the local departments have our number or they get on, you know, the internet or whatever and, and find us. They call that dispatcher, give them all information. They send a message out to our entire team. This is what we got. This is where it's at. Who can go? Uh, a lot of times in the human remains aspect, we can schedule it a couple of days out yeah. for the most part, <clears throat> unless it's a building collapse or fires, that kind of thing. Um, and then we, that's kind of how that initiates from the fire department side. It's usually, I get a phone call from, our rescue divisions, battalion chief, hey, we had a fire or somebody's missing, we need dogs. Um, from the FBI standpoint, the field office that I'm going to be working with will reach out to me. Um, I, I love the way they do things as far as they give me very minimal information because they don't want me influenced by anything. Yeah, It's more of a, you show up, this is where we want you to search, tell us what you find. Yeah, um, Always, obviously, extremely well organized, laid out, and, and it's... Um, you kind of come in, do your thing, and go. So that's kind of the three ways I get um, contacted to, to do searches. I gotcha. Um, are there any that stand out? I guess in that progression that uh, that were either super memorable or, or rewarding or or challenging and and disappointing or. Um, between there, um, I know I did uh, a, a fire one that I remember. We actually ran the fire. 
Uh, it was house explosion and it natural had, gas or what? Um, yeah, it was, it was gas and they were, it was a meth lab and the whole, and so we ran the fire, uh, as it <clears> were, <throat> um, and I didn't have storm with me, um, at the station, but so we ran the fire. They're like, yeah, there's a guy missing. Rushing division chief was there. He looks at me. He's like, can you get your dog here? Said, Absolutely. Call my brother who's, he likes dogs, but he's a little nervous around big dogs. So yeah. I'm like, Hey, I need you to go pick up storm. Yeah. <laughs> And bring her here. Grab a hold of your nuts. Yeah. Pick the dog up and bring her here. Yeah. So he shows up in his, you know, his police car with Storm. And uh, and we went to work. And uh, and she made an indication. We found the guy. But but for me, the, the coolest thing about it was her. She didn't care. She didn't give a shit what was going on. Yeah. We, we searched around the outside of the building, went up. You know, it was a not a huge house. And it was kind of all collapsed in the basement. Um, some of the rest of you guys had found a, made a spot to get down into the basement. Well, the, the upstairs hallway had dropped into the basement. It was kind of off kilter and like, Hey, we have a spot Will your dog go in there. And I'm like, yeah, she'll go in there. So we went down, I sent her on her own, seen her go down the hall, checking each room on the way back. Then she come back past me and got into where a big pool of water was that from all the, the water we were using and it just absolutely blew up an indication, pawing out the water, trying to get back in there. And, uh, once, we kind of put it all together. The guy was right above that. So all the water had come over him down into that pool. So she was kind of underneath where he was at. Oh, that's cool. Uh, it, go ahead. No, it was just, it was, it was cool to see. Cause I mean, it was, it was one of those, just no doubt. I mean, there's yeah. no doubt what she's doing right now. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Was, uh, was that her first post fire search or had she done other burn um, down structures? We'd before? done other, uh, fires, but usually, uh, we hadn't made any other re fire recoveries, um, but they were all, we think somebody might be in here. We're not sure. We do a search. We don't find anything. And then they kind of go do the thing. Yeah. There's nobody in there. Yeah. From, from a handler standpoint, are there other factors to consider outside the obvious? Like it's super unstable and you know, who knows what's in there from a danger standpoint, but from a, from an odor standpoint, are there accommodations that you make or things that, that need to be considered for them searching through burnt down structures, et cetera, or, or post fire versus every other environment? Um, for me, it's like you said, it's a safety aspect of, you know, do we have any idea what's going on in here? What's the, you know, how ventilated is a structure? You know, if it's pretty wide open, I don't worry too much about it. Um, but yeah, it's more of a safety of the, the structure. Um, other chemical wise, I mean, it's, it's one of those that you just have to be your dog's advocate. And yeah. like, there's times where I'm like, well, we just can't search that. It's just not, yeah, it's not safe know, enough. Yeah, yeah. I can't put her in that, you know, and, and I think that's one of the differences in what we do is they're, they're not our pet, but they, they're ours. Yeah. You know, they're still your partner. And yeah. right. And so I'm not in to, to me, she's not a piece of equipment that I can yeah. send in and be like, Oh, well, that didn't work. So we'll just get another one. Yeah. Um, so you really got to be our own advocate for them. Yeah. And, uh, so, yeah. Uh, can you share how, how the connection, uh, basically how, how you got involved, uh, with the FBI and, and ultimately doing searches for them? Yeah, I was, I was at a, uh, I went to a seminar. There's, you know, all year long, there's some search rescue seminars. Um, there was one out in, uh, Salina, Kansas that I went to and, uh, didn't really think much about it. It was just work and storm doing our thing, having a good time, um, just, you know, building our, on our training. Um, there was a, a guy there that, um, I knew him. I'd met him actually years ago when I was working on my previous dog at a different seminar. And I knew he, uh, he was a dog handler for the FBI. I'm a uh, super great guy, tons of knowledge, animal behavior, um, type stuff. And so I knew him and I seen him at the seminar. I'm like, Oh yeah, there's Craig, you know, that, um, so we talked somewhat, but, he had never seen storm work at the time. And then um, over those few days, by the, the last rotation we did, um, he's like, you know, I'd like to see that dog work some more. I'm like, what do you want to see? You know, I'm, I'm up for whatever. Let's, yeah. And uh, so I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking, does he want to see something right now? What's he? And he said, well, would you be opposed to us taking, you know, flying you out to do some training at the FBI facility? And I'm like, <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me think about that. Yeah, hey, let me think. No. Uh, you, do you mean to go to today or, yeah. you know? Yeah. But uh, so that's kind of how it started. And uh, so, of course, I'm like super pumped. For me, that's like, you know, was, was going to be the ultimate yeah. deal. So we kind of left it at that, exchange information. And 
several months went by. I think it was maybe five or six months. I never heard anything. I'm like, well, that it just didn't work for whatever reason. Yeah. And then I get a message, you know, inviting me to go out and, and train. Well, at the first, at first it was an assessment uh, deal to go out and that's kind of what started all of it. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, I know there's certain details of, uh, from a search standpoint that you uh, have to be careful about talking, I guess, from, from what you can talk about, um, can you share whatever you can from, from your time uh, doing it for them? Yeah. Um, first off, I mean, it, it's, it's everything you would think the FBI, as far as their facilities, amazing. The people are amazing. The training is, is, you know, second to none. Clean shaven khakis and polos. Right. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so then yeah. this dumb Midwestern fireman yeah. shows up with this crazy ass Malinois. Yeah. Uh, but no, it was, it's, uh, it's a, an amazing experience every time I get to go out there. I go out a few times a year to train with them. And then, so I kind of go through their process. It's, you know, they're kind of pushing the boundaries to see where, we, where we're at. And then once they are comfortable with where we're at, um, then it's, uh, you know, they put the word out to the field offices. And then, so when the a field office has a case going on, we need a dog, um, they reach out to the Forensic Canine um, Center Um and that, which is also their evidence recovery, um, center. And they reach out to them. This is what we have going on. We need a dog. Okay. We have this guy in the Midwest, give him a call. Then they contact me and then I go from there. And, uh, it's been an amazing experience. I've got to go to some really cool places. Um, but it's usually, I get a phone call. We set up a date. Usually for them, it's, it is cold cases for the most part. So we can schedule it a week or two out. Um, <coughs> we fly out to, to where they're at. I said their their searches are, you know, put together like no other. They have maps. They have everything. Um, they're really good about. Like I said not giving me more information than I need to know. Just from a legal standpoint of when I go to court, I didn't know anything. Yeah. I showed up. I worked my dog. This is what I found. And I left. Yeah. Um, so they can't get into that hole. Well, you knew that yeah. this car was the one. You know, so there's none of that going on. It's, and uh, but I've I've gotten to go several different places. I've probably done not a ton of searches for them. Probably. 10 or 12. Yeah. But they're always something super unique, super, um, interesting. Yeah. Um, some of them are well-known cases. Some of them aren't. Um, but it's always a, a really good experience. And then the follow-ups always, you know, a lot of those, I never hear the outcome. true outcome of it. Yeah. And which is kind of weird. Cause you know, as a dog handler, you want to know was, yeah. was she right? Was she wrong? Did I miss something Did you know? Um, so I, a lot of times I don't hear the results, but, uh, but it's a it's an amazing opportunity for me. It's just someplace I never thought I'd be. Yeah, for sure. Is there a most unique environment that uh, you've searched for them? Can you share? Uh, for them, let me think. Um, no, no, nothing. The environments for them aren't usually anything crazy. You know, it's houses, vehicles, fields, that kind of stuff. Um, more of the crazy environments are the you know the the fires and collapses and that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, I said with my dog before storm, we searched in a cave. We, they, they dropped us in like 70 feet. Yeah. Um, that wasn't an FBI search, but theirs are usually more straightforward vehicles, structures. Like yeah. Stuff. Is there a, um, like a, I don't know, a, a phrase or a, a, an element that you could put together that, um, showcases how how well put together they are i guess or or maybe a better way to ask it is a lot of shit that you see in the movies in terms of how organized and put together is it absolutely yeah. like that or from my point of view yes yeah. i mean it's it's i mean their facility everything's squared away um you know the first time i went out there to train you walk into a classroom there's a spiral notebook, name tag, bottle of water, bottle of poop bags, pen. I mean, it's, it's yeah. squared away. Yeah. And, uh, but they're, they're normal people too. I mean, when you get out training dogs, I mean, they're, they're, their main dog guys, they're, they're dog lovers too. They, yeah. you know, but, uh, but their stuff is, is very much in it. I get, I mean, it has to be for all their legal reasons because they don't want any loopholes that can be. Sure. Um, but yeah, everything, even like I said, their facility spotless. I mean, it's, yeah. it's like walking into them for me. The first time I went there, I was like, this is amazing. Yeah, you know? that's awesome. Yeah. Is there something that would surprise most people that you weren't expecting about working with slash for them? I think probably the uh, the knowledge of the guys that I work with for the dog wise is incredible. Yeah. I mean, they're absolute um, animal behavior specialists. I mean, yeah. just their knowledge of 
working dogs and, and things to do to fix a little problems. And, you know, you yeah. talk about reading a dog, those guys can read a dog yeah. before the dog knows what it's doing. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you can, if you can share it or not. Um, what, how, how many dogs does the FBI have? Do you know? Um, I, I don't, I know, um, kind of the program that I'm involved with where, um, you know, I don't actually work for them. Um, you know, as far as, yeah, I mean, I, not an employee. So there's, they have, um, dogs around the country that have been through their program that they, um, have vetted, um, put through the program. Yeah. These dogs yeah. are the ones that, that we use. Yeah. I mean, to me, that's, that's a smart way to do it on their part it, it, because it, it gives you, you know, kind of a, a good network all over the country right, of yeah. solid people that, yeah. you know, are, are, they, they still have the, you know, the element of, um, competency and, and kind of everybody on the same sheet, but it's not, yep. you know, having to, to maintain a, a unit of 200 fucking people all in one spot and send them all over the place. Yeah. So, and, I, and I think that's kind of how it was for them. They were like, we, there's, there's a better way in yeah. this way, you know, I've been all over the place, but they'll have dogs, you know, in, in Arizona. Well, that's their environment. That's what they work in. So why not yeah. use a dog there instead of flying a dog from, yeah. you know, the East coast to go do a two hour search over here and then flying back. Let's yeah. use a dog that meets our requirements. It's here. Yeah. No, that's cool. Yeah. Um, is there something that, that would surprise people uh, about working with them that, uh, that they wouldn't have expected? Um, I don't think so. Other than, like I said, everything is to me exactly what my, you know, I've never been police, never been military, just, my knowledge of the FBI was just what I seen and heard yeah. on TV yeah. and is very much that way. Yeah. Um, like I said, other than, you know, the guys that work there, they're, they're regular dudes. They're just, yeah. that's their job. Sure. But, um, but nothing really, um, out of the ordinary other than their massive amounts of equipment. I mean, yeah. they have the equipment they can load up and go anywhere in the country at a moment's notice and have everything they need to process scenes. You know, yeah. um, wow. I, I think the gravity of how much, that is and the logistics of that alone is, was it's pretty impressive yeah i mean to me that the atf and the fbi between the two of them like the the competency and capability in in some areas specifically those uh are are really really impressive i think there's you know there's some areas that uh that they're not as impressive you know but uh but you know the canine aspect and the and the analysis and kind of field field craft aspect mm -hmm. is uh, is really really impressive yeah, watching them process a scene is, is pretty impressive. I mean, I'll bet. Working for, you know, I've done a lot of searches for a small town uh, sheriff or police department that just don't have the knowledge or haven't done the stuff enough. And to watch how they operate compared to running one of their scenes, it's just so night and day. Yeah. I mean, is it something where, like, they have machines that they're putting shit in and it analyzes and gives them results back type, type stuff? Or I've never seen them do that, but just from what I've seen, you know, when on the scene of something, when they're processing a house as far as oh, I gotcha. you know, searching a warrant and bringing things out and logging yeah. it and their, their whole process of, what to you pay know, evidence to and recovery. That. Yeah, Because yeah. yeah. that's who we, you know, like I said, the facility that, that I train at with them is their evidence recovery. And uh, watching that process is, is pretty impressive. Very yeah. strict. Everything's, you know... Because yeah. they don't want any of those loopholes. They don't want that. Yeah. You know. Sure. Uh, is there a story of, of a search for them that you, that you can share of uh, not necessarily where she was at, but just kind of similarly to the one that you uh, shared at the park? Um, I'm trying to think of what would be okay to, to, to say. Um, like I said, in a lot of them, I don't really know the background of. Yeah. Um, but there's, uh, I'm trying to think. I guess have, have there been instances where even not knowing anything where you you found something where you're like yeah I know she's finding something you know it's a, a body or it's a you know something where you know Yeah and it's and uh for them it was more evidence that we found you know is they get a good solid hard indication like yeah something's there yeah. something's right there then then they come in and, and do their whole recovery forensic stuff forensic yeah, stuff, yeah. <clears throat> um in in the one that's in my brain was a pretty, it's been a pretty high profile case. So I can't get into it, but it was, um, to be a part of that for me was pretty cool. And I wasn't expecting it. I yeah. wasn't expecting to get an indication where I did. And I was like, yeah, okay, well, I guess, <laughs> you yeah. know, I guess we're in it yeah. now. <laughs> can, I mean, can, without sharing where it was or anything, can you say what, like what was surprising about it? Um, uh, I think I just, I wasn't expecting, um, cause the initial search, when we went out there, I, I'm thinking we're looking for a full body and it ended up just through the course of the days we were out there in the investigation led to doing some other searches. And we found, um, 
more remains, but small stuff that couldn't be seen. You sure. know? And uh, so I think that was the thing that threw me off. Cause you know, you go, you know, if you're thinking we're looking for a, a body that's buried or a body that they stashed somewhere, that kind of thing. And then yeah. they're like, Oh, go check this. And okay. Yeah. I got yeah. something there. And, and then uh, two, two things stand out for me in terms of being a handler and trainer is that number one, the, the level of trust for your dog has to be a hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, number one, and, and that takes a while, and, and there's a lot of times where dogs aren't quite at that level. Where if you're going legitimately double blind, real world, like yeah. you better have a, a hundred percent trust in that dog. The other part is that um, even if you already have a hundred percent, how much more trust that that would put into your dog when they're yeah. surprising you, yeah, and it's yeah. verified by them that yep, yeah. they're sure. Like that's yeah. got to be a really good. Yeah, it, it is, and then, but I still think just me being me as a handler randomly on, on a search when I get something I question it. I'm like, well, was she really, was yeah. it something else that caught her attention? You know? Yeah. But uh, yeah, those times when, when it's, it's more satisfying to me t- to get that indication, you can't see anything. You don't know why, but you're yeah. confident something's in there. And then you find out two days later, yep, she was right. Yeah. Um, I mean, you miss out the rewarding at the time, but yeah. um, it's those to me are, are the, yeah. the best when yeah. you get that satisfaction of knowing yeah she was right even though i had no idea yeah of uh, of the stories you can share what is your favorite search story with her do you have one uh, uh yeah probably um the one that pops out actually what we were talking it was kind of in my head we there was uh these two brothers that had went missing they were involved in kind of a business deal um they traveled out of state to this guy's property trying to work out this business thing they're never seen again so um, they had brought another dog team in that, that searched another area. They weren't quite happy with how things went. So they, they brought us in and they, they wanted, and it was actually my whole search team, but in particular for me and Storm, um, they wanted us to search these barns, barn area. Same kind of thing. We go in, it was a big old Morton building. Um, it was a, on a farm, pretty clean barn. Um, had a stock trailer backed up to the wall you couldn't really see in. So I cut her loose, let her work. She gets to a spot in the floor, blows up indication. One of those things I couldn't see anything. It was the uh, barn floor was super dusty. Um, so I kind of pull her away from it, keep her working. Cause I, it, me, I didn't, I was like, mm, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Boom, right back to it, blows up again. So we mark it, um, keep her working. And she gets under the stock trailer, goes up under it. Another indication, super hard can't pull her off of it, uh, which I've done a lot of work with, uh, you know, kind of a trying to pull her away from source and her staying at it. So I'm like, okay, she's really on something here. Mark that location and finished searching the barn. And I checked after that, I'm like, I'm checking everything that looks off colored thinking maybe there's blood on the, in the dirt, got nothing anywhere else. So we left and I found out later, they think that's where the two guys were killed in that barn, one of them in that spot. And then that stock trailer later was, um, was involved and I think there was actual remains in it that we couldn't see at the time. Wow. So it was, it was pretty cool to find out later that, yeah. um, and that's since been that, that case is, is done. They've convicted the guy and, and that kind of stuff. So it's not. Oh shit. Case. So, I mean, she, she again proved, yeah. proved, uh, her, her nose, right. I guess. Yeah. It, it said <coughs> that the, the abilities in, and I'm sure you've seen it, uh, of a good dog in their, when it all clicks with them, their abilities just, it amazes yeah. me all the time. Yeah, you know, to me, I think the the hardest part about detection work is 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 I mean that the half of it that involves the dog is is pretty clear cut. You know, it's it's training, it's reading them, it's, it's all that. To me, the the other half, kind of similar to firefighting, I, I would assume, is the, is the science behind odor movement, how mm-hmm. the environmental factors yep. affect it. You know, something as simple as say coming into a building like like we're in now you know, the air conditioning or heat being on, are there any open windows? Are there seams under the doors? You know, how, how does that odor move? And something as simple as, you know, taking like a, a Halloween uh, fake smoke yep. device and, and turning it on and watching where it goes yep. in, in a house, you know, can teach you so much about now when you put that, that piece of the puzzle into it and, you, and you're watching your dog work and, and you've seen, okay, I know that in this environment that like if she's showing – a ton of interest in this weird corner that doesn't make sense. It's because, well, there's a crack, you know, in this exterior door and that window's open and the fucking heat's on. And, and it's, you know, yeah. Yeah. like that part of it is something that just takes 
a lot of experience and and being wrong and and uh, learning the hard way yep. in, in some cases and and that's I think the most technical aspect of it that surprises a lot of people and, and makes being a good da- dog handler difficult. Yeah, and, and I think that's another part of it for me is super fascinating that whole yeah. odor movement and the, yeah. the science behind it. You know that my retired dog Sadie. Um, what really made it the picture clear to me with that kind of stuff. I was at a seminar with her. Um, searched the room. It, you know, it was the the person proctoring the problem was there. Okay, search this room. And we go. It was an old school building. We go around. There's windows on this side. Um, old style uh, heaters under the windows, kind of thing. But we go on this side of the room, and and Sadie's just climbing the walls, just going, just climbing, climbing, climbing. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? So I'm thinking about it, thinking about it, and the, the proctor's like, work around the room, you know, just. So we got to the other side, over under the windows, I get an indication, and I find, you know, figure out the whole hot wall, cold wall. And it was actually a, a piece of bone that was 1,500 years old. Holy shit. Yeah, that was, that it, they, it was on loan from a museum. But there was enough odor off of that thing to travel up hot, you know, hot wall, drop on the cold wall for her to catch it across the room. You know, no shit. This one. Yeah. Dude, that's fascinating. Yeah, it was, it was amazing to me. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, so that statute of limitations on a dog's nose isn't going to work then, is it? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> 1,500 fucking years. Yeah. That's wild, man. Uh, fascinating stuff. Uh, you know, to me, the, uh, you know, again, everything that you've done with, uh, with storm and just throughout your career, the things that you've been through and, and what you continue to do is, is inspiring. It's motivating. Um, you know, and for me again, it's, there's an element of, of it being rewarding to see, see a dog that, that I had something to do with, even though it was, it, you know, wasn't any of the training of just, just providing it, uh, is really, really cool to see. So uh, is there anything that, uh, anything further you want to talk about or share? Uh, not in particular. I mean, like I said, I, I, I can't thank you enough for the opportunity because oh, it's really, uh, getting that dog really set things in motion for yeah. me. I've I learned. mean, I mean, to be fair, you, you did all the work, you know, I mean, um, she's a great dog, no, no doubt about it, but, uh, you know, to, to see all the, all the things you've done with her is, uh, is awesome, man. I'm really, really proud of both of you guys. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. It's, it's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun and, yeah. And uh, got to do a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Where, uh, where can people find you uh, if they want to do a seminar or, or have you come out or, or things of that nature? Uh, I'm on uh, Instagram. Um, you can look up my name, Darren Niemeyer. Um, I also have Storm K9 Solutions. I have an Instagram there. Uh, Facebook, same same thing yeah. uh, under my name or Storm K9 Solutions. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, just reach out. And yeah. Well, good shit. Uh, well, so there, there you have it, folks. I appreciate your service and what you continue to do. I know being a firefighter is, uh, is a tough job and, uh, and one that, uh, you know, I, I wish you the best of, of luck and success and, uh, and most importantly, stay safe. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, we get a lot of requests for, for dog podcasts and, uh, sometimes it can be difficult to, to find the ones you know, that are a good happy medium of, uh, of not so far in the weeds that it's super technical and, and kind of loses the, uh, the, the general listener, uh, but also ones that are uh, exciting enough. And, um, you know, it's a, a fascinating career that you've had and, uh, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to share. Absolutely. It. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, if you didn't choke yourself, uh, how about these team dog treats? Go ahead and check those out. Mike com, And, uh, Until next time, this is Mike Drop.